Greetings to all of you. We're back in church again, more of you this Sunday than we had last Sunday, and it's good to welcome you back into this room. We're still adjusting to a very different kind of season, and not everybody is returning yet, and that's fine. We're happy for live stream, happy that those who can't be with us yet here in the sanctuary are able to join us by live stream. And we are here to worship the Lord. If you were watching those announcements, you might have noticed just two or three ago on the announcements, it mentioned uh, our uh, children's church uh, meeting at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. And today, for the very first time, they were meeting by Zoom. And Pastor Travis was showing me on his phone an image of the kids uh, in their little Zoom frames. You know how Zoom works. You can see everybody on the screen. And, uh, and so they did that for the first time today. And we encourage you to be aware of that offering at 9 o'clock for our children. We're working on trying to get back to more children's programming very, very soon. But delighted to see some of our children in the room today. So glad to have each of those here with us as well. We're here to worship the Lord. This is a time in our uh, uh, national history as well as globally when everything is just kind of disjointed. We're experiencing a great deal of unrest. Not only the pandemic that we've been experiencing for many weeks now, but also just lately the unrest over issues of uh, racial justice. And so we're going to be reminding ourselves of that in the service today, addressing what the Lord has to say to us about it, and ending the service with communion. This is Communion Sunday, which is a reminder that we are joined as one in Christ Jesus. And uh, if you did not, those of you who are in the room, if you did not pick up uh, the little cup out in the foyer area, uh, take an opportunity somewhere in the service to step out there and and pick one of those up. We'll give you instructions about that later. Those who are watching by live stream, as we've mentioned this week, and as we've done the last two Communion Sundays, we encourage you to have elements on hand, bread or crackers, and a juice of your choice, whatever you choose to use at home, so that when we come to the close of the service, you can join with us, and we can be united in Christ as we share that observance. Let's pray together. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing and Glorify God with our voices, but let's begin with an opening prayer. Father, thank you for gathering us here this morning in this room and also many, many other places by live stream. Thank you, Lord, that in Christ Jesus we truly are joined in worship. And so, Lord, we lift our hearts before you. We unite our voices in praise, and we ask that you would be pleased to glorify yourself in this service today. For the praise of your name and for the strengthening of our souls, we pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. Jesus is the light, I'm gonna 
will clap my hands, I will stop my feet and shout, shout. I will run around, jump up off the ground and shout, shout. Thank you. 
several words to share that focus on all of our group as we worship here or at home, but especially a couple of words related to those of you who are in the room today. First of all, we want to acknowledge that we continue to have a large contingent of people who are worshiping with us by live stream, and we're so thankful that we have that available to us and that all of those who are at home and watching are joining with us in our worship today. We are continuing to improve that medium, and so if you are having difficulties, let us know that. We want to make sure that it's working well for everyone. 
We had a board meeting this past Monday evening and we lifted the restriction on sign up for service. And so I think some of you probably are here this week because you didn't have to sign up and that's an, an in, encouragement to us. Uh, and we will continue to revise and review on a weekly basis. So this Thursday evening, the board has uh, the regular June meeting of the board and we will be looking at this topic again. Week to week, we are evaluating and determining how we should proceed. So we'll keep you informed of any of those kinds of changes as they occur. Also, I wanted to note for those of you in the room, last week we had less than are here today, and yet I noticed something at the end of the service that hadn't occurred to me before. We are trying to observe social distancing, and so that means staying six feet apart. And it occurred to me immediately when the service was ended, if one person stops in an aisle, all of a sudden you can't get past them to go out the doors and leave without violating that social distancing. And that's important to some more than it is to others, but it's important to us as we resume to worship that we honor that for all of us and, and that we preserve that distancing. So here's what I'm asking those of you in the room to do. It's a nice day, so consider the parking lot, the vestibule. And if you can move out there for your conversations, that would be wonderful. Uh, if you are in the sanctuary speaking to somebody when the service has just ended, if you could step into a pew and keep a pew between you as you talk with each other, but if you could step into a pew, then that will keep the aisles open for those who need to make an exit. And if, uh, if we forget both of those, uh, keep in mind, if you're trying to get out, that there is an emergency exit at that corner and one up here. Uh, there's grass right outside those doors. You're not going to set off an alarm. So those are also options for getting out of the room if you're uncomfortable getting too close to other people. We really do want to honor that. And as you're having those conversations, please be mindful. Just kind of look around. If you see somebody waiting because they're not sure about stepping through the middle of a conversation, then move to the side, move into the pews, or do something to make sure that you give them room to get by you. Just be aware of one another in that way. I, I recognized that last week because part of our worship, part of being a church, is the fellowship that we enjoy. That's one of the reasons we want to be back. And so I, I don't think it would be good if I instructed you, don't talk, leave. <laughs> walk out the doors and go to your cars. I, I really don't want to do that because we're finally able to congregate again and I want to give you that opportunity to fellowship with each other but we also need to be mindful about the social distancing. So please um, mind that and, and take care of that. I mentioned earlier we're going to have communion at the end of the service. If you failed to pick up one of the little cups uh, that are out in the foyer, feel free sometime in the service to step out there and, uh, and get one of those, and we'll give you specific instruction when we get to the end of the service. A few other announcements. Uh, you might have noticed on the screen before that Mahaffey Camp has canceled their family camp for this year. They are going to endeavor to have youth and children's camps at a revised schedule. So there's information in the bulletin, which is online, uh, and I would recommend to you that you review that information so you'll know the Mahaffey schedule. Also, we've been announcing that Great Commission Day is being observed in our church through the month of June. This is our annual opportunity to raise an offering for our international work in many countries around the world. And I have been suggesting to you, you might want to tithe on your stimulus check or you might be saving some money because you're not getting that coffee every morning when you've been out. If, if you can create a little fund for Great Commission Sunday and just set apart uh, some of that money to help our international workers, it's critical this year because uh, due to reduced donations, they have had their uh, personal allowance and their ministry budget reduced by 10%. It's called pro rata allowance in the alliance. And so uh, they are receiving less funds to work on and less funds to live on. And if we can restore that with a healthy offering uh, for Great Commission Sunday, that will be wonderful. We're going to show you a video related to that next Sunday, but all of this month, uh, if you can be setting that aside, you can give it whenever you wish, but anytime in June, you can make that, that contribution. Finally, 
we are going to watch a video just now that honors our graduates. We have several who are here this morning and following the video, Josh Mitchell is going to make some presentations related to that. But first of all, let's watch and enjoy this video that honors those who have just recently graduated. This includes high school graduates and also uh, several college graduates. On a day 
day like the day when things are at their worst You'll come to quench my thirst if I just put you first On a day like the day as the tide is coming in Over my head again You've washed away my sin you have Out on my own I'm going nowhere fast You pull me close now I'm free at last I'm free Nice and proper. There you go. Um, if you guys don't mind, could we give these gentlemen a round of applause? And uh, and obviously, the, the applause goes for those of you that are watching online and those who couldn't be with us today. Also, uh, you guys have a special place in my heart. Um, and, I, and I know that you know that, but since I've started youth ministry, you. <laughs> You guys were the first graduating class, and so you will always be the, the impression that I have in my mind of what a responsible senior should look like and what responsible leadership should look like. Um, I mean, you guys taught me how to fish. I mean, I didn't catch a fish. You tried to teach me how to fish, I guess I should say. Uh, you, you rode your, my first plane. You were on that first plane ride. Um, for those of you that don't know, I actually had a dream that Cole uh, became a preacher. I'm sorry, Jeff. I've told him that numerous times. Uh, <laughs> It was a very vivid, accurate dream, I feel, and, uh, and Josh, I know that I've said this before, but, but you are one of the strongest people that I know. I think that I learned more from you in the years that I got to spend with you than what you probably learned from me. Uh, we have a gift for you. Um, feel free to, to take it when you head out, and uh, I pray that you use it. No shock, I'm sure you can guess what it is. It's you know, square, we're in a church. Uh, it's not a, yeah, exactly, not, they're not Legos, no. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to say I love you guys, and, and I'm thankful for what you're doing, and uh, let, me, let me pray with you before you go celebrate the summer. Father God, uh, we just come to you so thankful for the graduates this year, high school and college. Um, we know that things didn't necessarily work out at the end of this year, how they probably thought, but knowing these two here and those that are probably watching online, that happens more frequent in their lives than what we would think. 
I know that they know to turn to you in times of trials, and I pray, Father, that you just continue pr to protect them and bless them throughout their life. Uh, Jesus, just continue to do your stuff. We pray this in the precious, precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Grab a, grab a gift. Have a happy, safe summer. Don't do anything that Cole wouldn't do. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Josh, and we do acknowledge all of those, not only the two present here this morning, but others, as Josh said, watching by live stream. We're so proud of you, so happy for this accomplishment. I invite you to join with me as we bow in prayer, and we'll pray for our graduates once more, but also for a number of other requests that are before us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we pray this morning, we're reminded, even as we honor these graduates, that you have plans for us wonderful plans, perfect plans. You have designed each of us for your glory, and you intend to work out in our lives those things that will accomplish praise and honor unto you. Your plans are not to harm us, but to give us hope and to grant to us a future, a future, Lord, that follows in your steps and accomplishes great things for your name. So we lift up these graduates and pray that you would do your perfect work in each one. And especially today, in a time of civil unrest, Lord, we pray for all of our youth, because these are difficult times. And we pray that you would reveal yourself to every one of our young people, whether they are graduating from high school or college this year, or on their march toward that, or just beginning life in a new world with new responsibilities. Lord, may you raise up young people who will live faithfully for you and will draw others into your presence. We pray that you would do that, Lord, to give encouragement and hope to them and to grant a future not only to each of them individually, but for our nation, for all of us, as we look to fulfill your perfect will in our living. We pray, Lord, as we continue to march through this experience with coronavirus, that you would watch over those who are infected that you would restore them to health, and that you would protect others who are exposed. And we ask, Lord, that you would soon bring an end to the spread of this disease and grant in the meantime that we would look faithfully to you and see your will accomplished for each of us. We pray, Lord, for our international workers. We're thinking especially today of Steve and Claudia Irvin, who serve in Spain, and praying for Steve as he recovers from COVID-19. We thank you, Lord, that he has made a great deal of progress and appears to have turned the corner, but we pray that you would complete your healing and restore both of them to ministry. And thank you, Lord, for apparently protecting Claudia from being infected with it during this time. We pray, Lord, for those in our church who are battling cancer. We have a number, Lord, who are looking in trust to you for every day, even with regard to their treatments. We lift up especially our brother Mark Kruger, who is in Shadyside Hospital with an infection of undetermined source. Lord, may you protect him. His immunities are extremely low right now, and so we pray that you would protect him from any further harm and that you would help the doctors to know exactly how to address this infection so that they can bring it to an end and he can be restored to strength and be able to resume the treatments that he needs for his cancer. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, and we remember especially today the Chechek family in the loss of Craig's mother, Dorothy. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort the family during this time for Blake and for Hunter as her grandchildren. May you give them comfort in the loss of their grandmother, and we pray, Lord, that as they make these arrangements, you would walk with them every step through this and show yourself to be strong on their behalf. And others, Lord, Bob Reinhold and others who are grieving recent losses, we pray you, your continued strength and your comfort for each one. We pray, Lord, for other general kinds of requests. We pray for Tom and Linda Bowersox, for your protection upon their son, Andy, as he has been called out to deal with some of the rioting that has been happening, especially in the city of Indianapolis. We pray that you would protect Andy during this time, as well as all those others who are serving on police forces or in other ways are addressing these concerns. 
We pray, Lord, for Vicki Carroll, that a new medication, which she recently started, will have a positive uh, influence in her body and will cure her disease. We pray that her husband, Don, is doing well now after a lengthy recovery from, uh, from post-operative complications that he endured. May you continue to add your strength and support both of them as they look to you. We pray for Sally Cooley as she transitions this week to independent care. We pray, Lord, that the personal care home that she is entering would be a warm and welcoming environment and that she would make that transition well and give your comfort to the family. This is difficult for them to, uh, to see Sally make this transition. We pray that you would give them strength and encouragement in this time as well. We pray, Lord, your continued strength for Pastor Ellenberger. We pray that Pastor E and Flo would know the reality of your presence with them. Thank you for recent improvement in Pastor E's strength, ability to stand at his kitchen sink. And we pray, Lord, you'll continue to resolve his problems and restore strength to him daily and give your strength to flow and to the others, Lord, who are caring uh, for Pastor E during this time. We pray, Lord, for Diane Smith with another flare-up of her ulcerative colitis. May you heal her of this and resolve it completely so that she might rejoice in the healing hand of the Lord. And we pray, Lord, for a good outcome for tests that Don Smith has had just recently related to uh, heart concerns. And we pray, Lord, that the, these cardiovascular tests would reveal no enduring problem uh, or that the doctors will be given wisdom to know how to address whatever issues are there. May Don and Diane rest themselves in you and find comfort in your rich provision for them. And Lord, we pray today for Lyndon and Luke Stanton, who were involved in a quad accident uh, just yesterday. Lord, uh, Lyndon is in Ruby Hospital, pediatrics, 10-year-old with uh, multiple injuries, two broken ribs and a cut on his face and possible other internal injuries, and Luke has a bad cut on his hand. Lord, thank you for sparing their lives in this incident because uh, from the sound of it, it could have been much worse, and we pray that you would continue your grace upon them and bring quick healing to them. Give your peace, Lord, to Jim and Aaron as their parents and to the gallows as grandparents and the rest of the family as they await the final healing for these young men. And so, Lord, we commend them to your care. And as we turn our attention this morning to your word, we pray, Lord, that you would guide us in our consideration of a very important but also difficult topic. May our hearts be open to hear you speak, and may we be humbled to take the action that you direct. And we will give you the glory and the honor as you accomplish that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite Josh to join me on the platform. We have a special presentation this morning that we want to share with you. And as we, as we do this, uh, we are asking God's grace to lead us because this is a, a somewhat difficult topic and we want the Lord to be honored in everything that we say with regard to this. As you know, we've been involved in a series that we have focused on plague and pestilence and pandemic. And we've been talking about what God is saying to us, to us during a time when uh, we are suffering from a plague that has encircled the globe. And this morning we're taking a little different tack on that. I had actually chosen the text uh, for the day from Romans 12, verse 21, which instructs us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, as a launch into some discussion of how we can use such a time to see the Lord's will accomplished. Then in the midst of all that, that text was on my schedule to address uh, for this Sunday before any of these recent events happen. But in the midst of that, we have had these recent incidents uh, of uh, precipitated by an act of racial injustice, but then leading into rioting with looting and arson and violence, not only in the United States, but in a number of countries around the world. All of it launched by that one incident that happened in Minneapolis, Minneapolis and most of us, if not every one of us, has seen that horrible video 
uh, of a man with uh, a knee on his neck, uh, an officer holding him down and ultimately ending in the loss of life. And in the course of that, it was impressed on me that one of the things God does in times of suffering, we've been talking about what is God saying. One of the things God does is that he may use a time of suffering, whether it's an individual experience in our lives or something that is more of a corporate experience, to remind us that as bad as that particular suffering might be, there are things that are worse. And the thing that is worst of all, Josh, is the virus of sin that has infected all of our lives. Not one of us is excluded from that. And the scripture is very plain about that. There is no one who does good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we have seen a manifestation of sin in terms of the loss of life of George, George Floyd, and it has brought to the fore several other recent incidents that have occurred. And so we want to talk about that today, and we will get to that particular instance. I want to say, first of all, this may be an uncomfortable discussion, but I don't want any of us to retreat to the familiar positions with which we are comfortable, and to avoid addressing something that was horrid and needs to be commented on and needs to be discussed by Christians, if the church doesn't take the lead on issues of injustice, then where will any of us find leadership? And I also don't want to avoid the topic. So if you're watching by live stream, don't leave the discussion. If you're here in the room, don't walk out. We, we want to... We want to honor one another and honor this topic by listening very carefully to what needs to be said today. And we'll come back to that particular instance, but Josh, I want to begin by explaining to folks why you're on the platform with me today. And, and so would you share why this is personal for you, just a bit of your own personal history that makes this a, a real topic, an urgent topic in your own mind? Sure. Um... I want to start by saying thank you that we have an opportunity to acknowledge this within our congregation, our church family, um, in person and online. Uh, I think that it is something that, that needs to be discussed, especially in the church. Um, I've seen a lot of these conversations in the past two weeks, a lot of conversations between um, you know, a, a black person and a white person, a, a black man and a white woman, black woman and a white man, uh, police officers. Uh, ministers, uh, doctors, uh, and I think that even when, when I watch those conversations, the first thing that I identify is here is a conversation between a black person and a white person, and I, I think that it is important to keep that, to keep the color visual there. We, we don't want to lose sight of that, but I would encourage all of us, especially those watching online and those that are here in this room, to view this as a conversation, yes, between a black man and a white man, but as a conversation between friends and a conversation between family, church family, a, a conversation um, surrounded in, in grace and love. Because I think that if, if we don't view this conversation as a conversation happening between uh, two, two good friends, I, I don't think it's going to hit home. I don't think it's going to penetrate our heart. I, I think at that point that I'm just going to be another... Uh, black person with, with a microphone. I think it's also important uh, for me to, to address the fact that uh, it, to me it, it always seems a little crazy, but a lot of people actually don't know that I'm black. Um, when my father started attending this church a couple weeks ago, um, people were coming up to me after in good spirits and saying, I had no idea that, that you were black. And, uh, and, and I, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced that throughout my life, um, but I think that that contributes, obviously, to, to why this is so personal for me. I think that uh, I, can, I can very easily relate with the African-American community in their fear and uh, their suffering and their pain. I can also identify with the fear and the hurt that racial injustice causes on all fronts because my mother is a white woman and my wife is a white woman, 
and my, my grandmother is a white woman, and, and so because I can listen to, uh, you know, Kanye West or Kenny Chesney, uh, I'm in a unique position where I'm, I'm right in the middle. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking one side over another, and I can see that it really does damage on, on all fronts. But I would say that the reason that this particular instance is, is most personal for me is because it's the first time where I have been fully invested as a Christian in ministry and had to witness how the church or the faith responds to, to a very blatant act of, of racial injustice. And, and I think that that is, that is why I've probably lost the most sleep and, and why I've experienced the most pain. And I think that it's really rooted and surrounded in a, in a misunderstanding. And so uh, I'm thankful that we get to talk about it. And out of your experience, and we've talked some about this, uh, I, I'm about as white as I can be. No so comment. There's, so there's no question about that. I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, European, mainly Great Britain lineage, and, uh, and, and so I'm obviously white. Yours is more complicated uh, mm -hmm. because of a white mother, a black father, which means that you come today to this discussion with a perspective that is different than mine and an ability to address both sides of this question, which is very valuable. Uh, in, in one sense, you fit into both worlds, mm -hmm. and you've grown up in that. Correct. In another sense, you don't fit in either world. Correct. So you've experienced the dissonance of, at times, feeling like, I don't belong here, and I don't belong there. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, your personal journey is different than mine, different from many's, and it also reflects what we're talking about, true diversity. I mean, if we talk with every individual that we meet on this issue, we're going to see different perspectives. Sure. People come with different histories and not everybody is thinking the same. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I, was, uh, I was always black enough to um, be on the side, unfortunately, of some racial injustice myself. Uh, I know more recently, Something that happened, you know, two weeks ago. Molly has been um, running around our neighborhood in the morning as a, as a form of exercise, and uh, she got lost in our neighborhood. I'm not sure how, but she did. She got lost, and uh, she, when she came back into the house, she was talking about the our our neighbor's yard. She said, "Our neighbor, you know, it's such a beautiful yard. I ran through, uh, I, I ran through her yard." And I, I was immediately hit with, like, you, you can never do that again. You cannot run through somebody's backyard like that. Like, and, and, and it didn't, I, I didn't realize until later in the conversation that she was oblivious to that fear. That the, the fact that she was on uh, a, another white person's property in their backyard unannounced wasn't a, a thing to her at all, where in my mind, all I could think of was, was Ahmaud Arbery, who was running in his own neighborhood and, and was shot. And uh, so there's constant reminders on that front um, that uh, I, I was always black enough to, to relate to that fear. But I also, um, in, the, in the other standpoint, I, I think that uh, I was white enough to make other white people comfortable to say things in front of me that they wouldn't say in front of somebody who didn't have a white mother. And uh, th that, that has also um, always been a challenge. I, and I, I think that uh, the, the common misconception is, you know, be, because you're half, you know, you're half black or half white, and the percentage obviously isn't directly down the middle, but because of that, you, um, you know, you don't have it that bad or, you know, and, and just to alleviate that mindset at the beginning of the conversation, I've always still on every job application or you know, SAT test, I still have to check the, the box that says African American other or black. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do believe that I, I have uh, the blessed opportunity to look at it from both lenses. Mm -hmm. and, and that issue, running through a yard, speaks to the larger issue of racial profiling, which is something that black Americans live with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. White Americans typically are not even conscious of that. And I shared with you that some years ago, uh, when I was serving on the uh, Alliance National Board of Directors, a, a dear friend of mine who is African-American 
were sharing in that conversation the, the talk that he had to have with his two teenage boys when they were approaching driving age to instruct them about how to handle a traffic stop, mm. what to do, what not to do, to make sure that they didn't exacerbate the situation to the point where it could become violent. And I listened to that as a white guy thinking, I've got two sons and a daughter, uh, and I thought, I, I've never had that conversation. It never has occurred to me to have a talk like that with my children. It, it never was in my mind that they would be in potential immediate danger just because they were pulled over for a broken taillight or whatever else. Sure. And yet, that's not only something that happens, but it's something that young black men especially have to grow up recognizing is a real danger. And they have to learn how to negotiate in a society where they are the minority with a majority uh, culture that, uh, that may see them as a threat and things can happen that were never intended. Sure. And I don't know if I can bring up, I, I, I'll bring it up. <laughs> uh, you may not want to confess in front of the church and online, uh, you had a recent traffic stop. Mm, I did, uh, yeah. I, I'm comfortable talking about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the, are we talking about the one where Molly was with yeah. me? That, yeah, okay, so. Um, <laughs> I didn't know there were multiple. This is <laughs> Just, I mean, if we're in, in the spirit of full transparency, I feel I should, I should be, you know, I want to get the facts straight. Um, so, uh, so, yes, on a, on a very serious note, um, I remember uh, my, my wife had asked, uh, she, she, was, she was in the need of, of uh, she wanted to go shopping, she wanted to grab, like, new pajamas and summer outfits, and so we took a trip to uh, the Westmore in the mall, and... Um, on the way home, my wife and I were engaged in the conversation about the African American um, who was pulled over and his seatbelt got stuck and in attempts to release his seatbelt and uh, get his wallet out of his pocket to provide identifi identification despite communicating that that's what he was doing at the time, um, ended up being shot and killed in front of uh, his white wife and, and child in the back seat. And as we were having that conversation, I myself was pulled over, and uh, the fear in moments like that are, are very real. Um, and it is so important that I communicate that by no means am I saying that, that every police officer or every man in uniform, white or black or woman, is racist or has racial intent at the beginning of a traffic stop. But, uh, but uh, in, in the same sense, I need to communicate that it, 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 it is dangerous to nullify or, or act like the, that fear is not a very real present fear. I'm ashamed to say that in front of my own wife, I was so scared with my hands over the steering wheel that my, I couldn't stop my body from convulsing. And I was looking for, for a, a bottle of water because I thought I was going to hyperventilate. And the police officer was fantastic. He was super respectful and, and um, I, maybe he might have acknowledged that, but it was just in the moment after having that conversation, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's dangerous for us to assume on all fronts. It's dangerous to not look at every instance as, as an individual instance. I can't look at every traffic stop and every police officer in my rearview mirror as somebody with racist intent, and a police officer cannot look at every African American behind a steering wheel as someone who uh, is toting you know, a, a weapon or drugs. I, I personally own a, a handgun and I do not carry it when I drive um, because I don't want to have to answer the question, do you have any weapons on you in the vehicle? I want that answer to always be no, sir, which is something that, that I don't know a, a lot of other people can really relate to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and some people would not go out in their car without their weapon with them. Mm. But it's a, different, uh, it's a different evaluation if you're deal dealing with that kind of a cultural background. Well, all of that said, I also want to recognize that we're having this conversation on a Sunday morning with a, with a congregation that is predominantly white. And it would be easy for a predominantly white congregation to say, well, wait a minute. I didn't put my knee on anybody's neck. Mm. 
I don't have racist thoughts. You know, in one sense, we may be preaching to the choir, both here and live stream, in the sense that uh, our audience may say, that's not me, I wouldn't do that. I, I wouldn't think that way about another person. Uh, and in addition to that, we're also dealing with a, a context right now in our society where this incident with George Floyd has uh, accelerated into multiple protests and many of those protests have led to violence and led to breaking into stores and looting, led to setting cars and buildings on fire, all that kind of thing. It would be easy for us as a white congregation, largely white congregation, to conclude this isn't about me, it's not my problem. And number two, what about all this looting that's going on? How, how, how can we excuse that? You know, what, what does that accomplish? How does it honor George Floyd? So I think with regard to the latter point, part of what I want to say pastorally is for this conversation, we can't address everything in the time that we right. have on a Sunday morning. For this conversation, my desire is that we as the church will focus on that incident the racial injustice of that incident and not get distracted by all the things that have happened in the aftermath because in in a big sense those who have taken advantage of this time to do a lot of the other lawless stuff have hijacked the conversation now we're not talking about the real issue we're talking about all the stuff that we see happening on tv and secondly to say that it is our problem because one of the things that has been impressed more and more on me as a white pastor with a predominantly white congregation is that this, this virus of racist sin is not going to change until the majority white population makes it their issue. Mm. That a, a minority does not have the leverage to bring about the systemic changes that have to happen so that all men and women are treated justly. And I think that's part of what has arisen out of the conversation right. you and I have been having. It's, it's past time for the white church to step up and speak out against obvious injustice and say we are going to take ownership of beginning a change that will make a difference for those who are minorities. We're focusing on white black today but all colors. All right. right, absolutely. Yeah, uh, there was a lot there. Um, I completely agree. And I think that, that it's, it's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That sounds a lot better coming from you than it would have coming from me. I'm glad you, you brought up the need for the, the white voice and the white response in the midst of everything that's going on. To touch base on that briefly, I think that it is important, one, coming from a black man to address a predominantly white congregation and those viewing online, that I personally, and I do believe that I speak on behalf of, of the African-American um, African community when I say, I do not blame somebody, they do not, we do not blame somebody because they are white. And I have so many white close friends that say, you think that this is my fault just because I'm white or you think that this is my fault just because I'm not waving around a, a cardboard sign that has BLM on it, just because I'm not running into every target that I, that I see and shouting Black Lives Matter, you, you're telling me that, that I'm at fault. And I think that there is a very big difference between um, a, a white voice being used as a proponent against racial injustice and the expectation that I believe that has been set in our current culture on what is and is not required of you uh, to make the situation better. I, I think that there's a lot of people who are, are now demanding extremes. I had a fantastic conversation with a me uh, one of our youth uh, a couple days ago, and, and she was talking to me about how she, she feels like she, f she had felt compelled to respond on, uh, via social media uh, because those who weren't responding were being condemned and, and uh, victimized. And uh, that, that's, not, that's not how we're gonna bring about change. I think, that, um, I think that it has to come from the heart and I hope that, that this conversation is easier 
because we are in the faith together. I think that uh, if, I, if I would have this conversation with somebody in a, in a secular, secular community, it's easy for me to say, I, I truly believe that it is your voice that could help bring about change mm -hmm. because I've been using my voice my whole life and very rarely is it heard, but your voice is so different. And um, in a secular community, it is so easy for somebody to say, that is not my problem. Mm -hmm. But as followers of Christ, that is our problem, regardless of the color of our skin. Right, right. And, and if we hone in on that focus, uh, I don't think anyone in this room or even watching us, I, I, I can't imagine anyone would disagree that what we saw on that street in Minneapolis was horrifying. Uh, if we focus on that, almost nine minutes of a knee on the neck of a man who was no longer any threat to those officers or anyone else, he was handcuffed, lying on the ground, you listen to the transcript of what was happening, and George Floyd was using words like sir and officer and please. He was being polite. He was ultimately begging for his life, and at one point called out for his mama, who I learned later died some years ago. Mm. That's a cry of desperation. Or maybe even as my wife commented, in his dying moments, maybe he saw or thought he saw his mama. This is a, this is a, a large black man that would perhaps intimidate some people standing on the street and he's crying for his mama. And I watched that, and as I evaluated, you know, I mentioned to you this week, and I don't think you were aware of it, there, there's a genre of films that are called snuff films. There's actually a black market for that kind of junk. It's considered pornographic. People find sexual gratification or titillation in watching someone literally be killed in a movie not simulated like a lot of action films might be, but a real death. There's a black market for that kind of stuff. And I thought, we watched a snuff film broadcast on national TV. And I cannot imagine if Jesus was standing on that Minneapolis street observing that and assuming that he didn't intervene and remembering that 10,000 angels could have rescued him from the cross and he elected to die for our sin. He didn't save himself. If he stood there and watched that, would not our Lord have been brokenhearted mm. and weeping and grieved by that manifestation of sin, the evil, wicked aspect of sin being played out in front of a whole nation on that street? And it's to me, that is enough to say it's time for us to respond. If we don't respond, we give assent. If we don't respond, we essentially say it's not important enough to care about. Right. In whatever Black Lives Matter has been politicized. But if we don't respond, we're saying black lives don't matter. And, and, and that is not an acceptable response from the church. We, we should be those who are seeking justice. I was asked the question last night, what, what would Jesus have done in that moment? And, uh, you know, I, I thought about it for a long time, and I thought about that. And I know that there are so many people who are just waiting to hear you know, the, the words black lives matter or all lives matter or a stance or a position on that. And this is where I just pray for grace and open hearts. But, but when I thought about what, from studying the gospels, what I feel Jesus would have done in that moment from a ministerial standpoint is that of, of course, all lives matter, but Jesus's ministry was, was surrounded at the forefront of standing up for those who are sick or or 
just to, to provide justice. Um, for those on the margins or those most Absolutely, vulnerable. those, he I, he, I mean, he said it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. And uh, I, I, am, I worry about, I, I worry about the, the, the politics surrounding it. I think that the most powerful thing on earth would be a red hat that said, make America great again. And on the back, it said BLM or, or on the sides or on the front. But if we could join that front, I think that there would be so much change. And, but for some reason, we are always, and it's been that way since I came into the fold of faith. It's, it's just one decision after another. I remember being discipled at Panera Bread. You know, the first, the first couple things were like, all right, am I going to use foul language or am I going to not? Am I going to, you know, go to a bar or am I not? Am I going to do this? And, it, and then that, that just follows suit throughout your entire walk with Christ. But it, that, it shouldn't be that way with this. There shouldn't be, uh, there, there, I, I just don't, I don't understand and I don't see the opposition to a movement like Black Lives Matter, but I think it's also important that I communicate from the lens of a, of a young black man who does have a white mother that, and maybe to preface this, I, I should explain something. When I was in high school, I remember a moment where, and I don't know that I've shared this with you, I remember a moment where, and it was, it was planned for a week, that the white kids from the mountains were gonna come down and fight the black kids from the projects on the bus patio at Wednesday at 2.30 before everybody left to go home. And it was planned and there was everything but signs on the walls. Everybody knew it, it was happening and it caused so much division in our classrooms and it caused so much division in our sporting events. I mean, kids that have played basketball together for years wouldn't speak to each other, they wouldn't pass the ball to one another. And, and it all stemmed from something that had happened and was, was showcased in the media. And I remember that day going to my bus, I remember seeing the, the black kids come out with hoods. And I remember seeing the white kids have Confederate flags wrapped around their hands. And that was the first time I had ever seen a Confederate flag. And what that did was, was permeate a very negative racist attachment to the Confederate flag. As an adult, now I can recognize that that is not the intent of everyone who puts it on their truck or their car or in their yard, or I, I realize that. And I would just ask for that same realization from the white community when they see someone carrying a sign that says Black Lives Matter. A very, very close friend of mine, he gave a speech at my wedding it, he called me over the weekend. He said, I am so sick of seeing Black Lives Matter on everything. I turned on my PlayStation. I wanted to play Call of Duty. And when you turn on Call of Duty, all I see is Black Lives Matter. And he said, I just associate that with when it started, there were acts of violence. And, and I connected the two. And I had shared with him, that sounds so much like how I connected that Confederate flag to, and, and I have family members, white family members that have Confederate flags on their vehicles. And, and I mean, it's just at a point you have to recognize and, and not generalize and detach these, these broken images that we have connected. When, when I view Black Lives Matter, I see a movement for, for, towards peace or injustice. And I can't say that of all of my friends. And, and I, th I, th I just think that on that topic, it's important that I make that statement because I, I think that that is, is what has been just like cutting me to the bone is when I see someone say black lives matter and then somebody says, no, all lives matter. And I say, of course all lives matter. We're in the faith, we're Christians. Of course they do. But right now somebody is sick and we gotta step up and do something about it. And I know that that's not the popular opinion, but I am attempting to provide a look at that from a, a black friend and not just somebody sitting up here with a microphone with dark skin. And so I hope that that resonates in your heart. Yeah, and that, that illustrates perception is so important because uh, the, if, if you put yourself uh, in a black skin and try to look at this whole thing from that standpoint, the decades and even centuries of living in a culture where it seems like we are not important and we are not valued. In fact, so many things have devalued us. Then the frustration is so great that obviously it's expressed in terms of our lives are important. 
we are people. We deserve to be honored. We deserve to be granted esteem. Black lives matter. You know, it's, it, uh, and as I say, it has been politicized in many ways. Right. But the underlying frustration we need to recognize, especially as a church, and say it's no wonder after all this time of always being subjugated that people are just pleading to just acknowledge who we are. Just grant to us the human dignity and worth that is justified as a creation of, of God. And, and with regard to perspective and perception, you know, as, as I mentioned, if I imagine Jesus standing on that sidewalk, what would his response be emotionally to what he observed? I also thought, and I forgive me for interjecting you into this, but I, as a church family, it, it was impressed on me. If we watched that video, and it was Josh Mitchell under the knee, not one person in this church would not be outraged by right. that. Right. And we would probably be marching in the streets. We, we would refuse to accept that as an acceptable police tactic. But it's easier for us to distance ourselves if we don't know the person. And, and I think somehow we've got to enter into that experience as a, as a white culture to say, in Christ, I do know that person. That is a brother. I don't know a lot about him or her. I don't know all the particulars. But I, I can recognize injustice when I see it, and I'm outraged by it, and I will not accept that any longer as a construct in our society. I, just like I'm, just like I don't expect a lot of people to, be, to, to understand what, it, what some of the things that I go through because I'm half black and half white or, or a white person relating to a black person, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to fully understand what it means to be white. But I know that what, what you're proposing is challenging. I understand that the, rec the need to recognize everyone as a brother and sister in faith is challenging and I know that because when I watch the video of the murder of George Floyd, I watch a video of two brothers that were lost in sin and not just one. It, it has to be just as challenging for me to accept the man who, who had his knee on another man's neck for nine minutes. I have to accept him into the fold of brotherhood through, uh, through the lens of Christ, just like a, a, a white person would have to look at, at, at an African American. And so it does go both ways, but I do, Unfortunately, and I, and I heard it said in another sermon that if it was somebody, and not to, not to put myself on a pedestal, but somebody, somebody who's willing to run down an aisle with a wig and a cane with toilet paper on it to make some kids laugh, if it was somebody like that who was on the street, you're right. But that's never, it's, it's always somebody over the weekend said, did you hear what, what George Floyd did in, in 2007? And I said, you know what I did in 2007? <laughs> I said, why do we keep doing that? Why do, why do we keep doing that? Can we talk about what he did in that moment? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I agree with you in the plea and the encouragement for us to all view one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and recognize that it is only through God's grace that that's accomplished. So it's so easy for us to shove it over here or over there, categorize it, and thereby dismiss it and not address the injustice that is right in front of us. And as we share this conversation, the question then becomes, and hopefully you and I can lead all of us to begin at least a conversation about this, what do we do? What, what do we do in this moment? What do we do as the Church of Jesus Christ? Mm. So let's talk a little bit. Sure. I, um, where do we go from here? What, are there action steps that we can take? What can we do that would, that would help to begin the change that we need to see? Uh, we've, we should definitely stay hopeful. There have been so many, so many of our youth and so many adults, both black and white, who, who recently have said, I have no hope that this will ever get fixed. This will always be broken. This will always be this way. And if, if, we, if we abandon all hope, we've lost the battle. So first, stay hopeful. 
But in my opinion, and this also is not popular, but it also applies to the African American community as well as the white community, we need to invite the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to please identify any, any behavioral patterns or thought processes or word choice that we may have or become accustomed to over the time that is a, a proponent of continued racial injustice. I, and the reason that I, I, I mean, obviously, we, we need the Holy Spirit to enact any real change in us, but the reason I'm saying that now more than ever is, is, is a, we have a need to pray for that, that revelation in our lives is because our pride, my pride, and other people's pride will always be a wall between something that does need changed and something that the Spirit wants to change inside of us. There will always be there will always be something inside of us that says, well, I'm not that bad. You know, I'm not, uh, especially in terms of racism. And I think that there are so many things that can be, it's such a layered conversation because as an African-American, I need to recognize that I can't walk around uh, without a little bit of tough skin. I'm not saying that, you know, nobody is perfect. We're always gonna accidentally, you know, say something that could offend somebody. So we, we need to make sure that we're not easily offended. But I do know that there's so many people on both fronts who, who say such subtle things that are just embedded into the way that they live that they don't recognize the dangers of their word choice. And one of the instances that I'm thinking of specifically is I had a gentleman in my driveway two weeks ago and he had lost his job due to, to COVID-19 and uh, he, he finally had got a little bit of work. And I said, man, I'm glad you're working. Who are you working with? He said, I'm working with a couple of my buddies and this Mexican guy. And I, and I just, like, I, just, I stopped and I said, are you friends with the Mexican guy? He's like, yeah, I've known him forever. Then what is the need to identify him separately in the conversation? I was on the phone with somebody who said, I'm having an issue with a black coworker. And in, Again, on both fronts, I can't sit here and say, man, you're never going to believe what this white guy told me at church, you know? And so just little subtle things that to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal in us, hey, maybe it's something, maybe it's something big. My daughter will never date a black man. Maybe it's something more subtle. You're never going to believe what this black lady told me at work. But a sincere ask that the Holy Spirit reveal in us anything that could be dangerous and, and ask for just a total elimination of that in hopes that we can all work towards a common goal. Yeah, so praying that the Lord will reveal our blind spots to us, and, and we all have those, whatever race. Right. And, and that, that's a good point because I can remember some years ago, uh, it occurred to me that uh, just in conversation, if the race of the individual is not germane to the conversation, if there's not some reason why that needs to be mentioned, if I'm just talking about somebody that I met, I, I don't need to say white person, black person, right. yellow person. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's not necessary. And, and, and began to school myself that, you know, I, I don't need to make that reference. That, that's not pertinent to what we're talking about. And there are, re there are times where that's necessary. I was right. having a conversation with a, a guy on the phone last week, and his name was Craig from work, and he said, Josh, I just wanted to encourage you. I was having a conversation with a black man, but he said that because he wanted me to know that where that perspective was coming from. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean just because you choose that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. And, it, and it, it's not overtly racist to comment on that. It's right. just that right. it isn't necessary to the conversation and that's one of the ways we can begin to school ourselves to think uh, more inclusively about those that are not of our race and, and right. so that's that's one thing that certainly can be done you talked a little bit when we were discussing this week about the power of speech and right. uh, share a little bit of what you sure have thought yeah about and we lot. talked about this we, we talked about this a lot at capacity on Wednesday one of my least favorite phrases on earth is that talk is cheap. I mean, like, what, what does that make us? Like, what are, what are, like, what are we? Talk, talk is cheap. That's what I do. Yeah. I talk. And, uh, and I understand that talk is However, cheap. However, we don't charge for it. So. 
That's true. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Oh, man. There goes that argument. So anyway, um, so I understand that when, when the phrase talk is cheap is normally made in reference to a lack of action in some regard. Yeah. But I, my, in my, I, mean, I mean, talk is not cheap. Um, the most powerful thing that I have is my voice. The most powerful thing you have is your voice in the, in the same for every, anyone here and those watching online. And uh, I think that where we direct that, that can, can either be a source of healing or it can be a cause of damage. And I think that it, it just starts with, if we're, if we're asking what can we do when we leave here today to actually be a proponent of change that doesn't mean I need you to go stand uh, you know, in front of Walmart with a Black Lives Matter sign, what can we do? What is, what is a practical application that I can help to curb this injustice and bring peace to our country? Um, it's, it's choosing your powerful words. Where do we start these conversations? Do I approach somebody and say, uh, you know, man, I, I watched this guy run out of Target with a TV and, and, and there's, you know, all these stores are burning down. Do I start the conversation there? Or do I choose my powerful words somewhere else? You know, do I start the conversation with there is racial injustice in this country? And then if it leads to that conversation, then, then we get to that conversation. And then just briefly touching on uh, a, a wise man once told me that anything that you say before the word but in a statement, you're probably better off leaving out. And it's, ch it's challenging in my own life. I catch myself all the time. And I hear so, so many times, I'm not racist, but um, black lives matter, but, uh, you know, he shouldn't have died, but did you see that kid running out of Target with a, with a big screen TV? And just using our words for good, to, to glorify God and not continue negativity. Right. And particularly, and you're in the heart of this, with regard to what we are teaching our children. And, and the scripture tells us, counsels us, that we have an obligation as believers to teach our children, to sit down with them and talk to them about issues like this. And so it, uh, every white family and every predominantly white church can have a conversation with their children to let them know, look, this is not acceptable. Don't ever let the seed of racism take root in you. And here are some things to be watching for. So that, that, that's powerful. That's, that talk is not cheap. That's very, very powerful. And our children begin their, their first inkling of how to treat others justly. Starts with what they hear their parents say, what they see their parents do, and then what is espoused from their church, the emphasis that is placed on that. Uh, so that's the, that's the power of proper instruction language. I think that, that that's a fantastic point in regards of, of teaching our youth. And I could only imagine, it's easier for me to have that conversation with my daughter than it would be for a, a, you know, a white man to have that conversation with a, a white daughter, white son. And uh, I think, and it, I mean, in understanding the difficulties of having, difficulties in having a conversation with a child, and I won't get into context, but I remember, it's funny, I was just talking about this the other day. I remember when my mother gave me the talk, right? And um, I love my mother, she might be watching, that she did not do that right. She, she started that conversation that we were not super wealthy, and so sometime when I was like two or three years old, my sister and I would take baths, and we would use the same bath water. And so the conversation started with, uh, Josh, you know how like you and your sister have are you, like a little different, and like so that was the pr that's how that started, and so obviously that mental image followed suit throughout the entire conversation. It was the worst thing. It, it was terrible. All of that to say that conversation lasted all of five minutes, and I have never forgot it. Yeah. And so it is not just enough anymore to say I am not racist. I do not. I do not. Um, you know, I don't. I don't act on racism. Um, and, and assume that your children are going to just follow suit with, with that passiveness. Because what we're doing when we don't purposely teach against racial injustice, especially in white homes, is we leave a blank canvas in the mind of our youth for someone else to paint on. And it will get painted on. And there's no guarantee that, that what they're going to put on that 
is, is what you had in your mind by staying quiet on right. the topic. Right, right. Well, we've gone at some length longer than uh, we anticipated. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with this comment and then proceed to communion together. Uh, as we look at this whole issue, it is an issue of justice versus injustice. It is an issue where not saying anything can become passive racism. We yield the floor, we yield the venue to somebody else who is exercising racist kinds of activity. Uh, and it's also an issue where the church has got to be proactive and not reactive. The, uh, the tendency is when these things happen, then the church responds in some way, but we need to be out front. It, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, Martin Luther King made some comment in one of his speeches about with regard to racism, that it's time for the church to be the headlight and not the taillight. Right. Uh, we've got to shine a light on it. We've got to expose it. We can't be uh, coming up in the rear. We, we, we've got to be out front and uh, making an issue of this. And even if it's in small ways, changes of attitudes, what we say to our kids, recognizing the latent racism that may be in our lives simply because of what we grew up with and what we were exposed to and what was normal for us. We've got to be conscious of all those things and begin those changes that will make a lasting difference. So, and as we come to the end of this service, what better way to remind ourselves that whatever color, we are one in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. than to share in communion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and before we receive uh, these elements, uh, just a word of instruction to all of you. If you have your little cup with you, I want to remind you, uh, if you look closely at that cup, there is a thin, clear film on the very top. Uh, so don't open the whole thing. Just find that little thin, clear film. When you peel that back, there's a little round wafer, which is tasteless. <laughs> but uh, don't expect a treat. Uh, and, and that is the bread. And then when we get to the cup, you'll peel the next layer off uh, to expose the juice. And, um, and that layer can be a little tough to pull, so be careful because we don't want you to spill it all over yourself. Uh, but uh, we'll lead you through that in just a moment. As we prepare for that, Josh, would you lead us in a prayer? Absolutely. And um, ask God to reveal himself to us, this issue to us, to bring us to a genuine repentance where that's needed and, and just to unite our hearts in a way that we've never experienced before uh, as the people of this land, the people of this world, people whom Jesus loved and died for uh, as we come to this service together. Father God, I am so thankful that we have an opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm thankful that we had a platform to attempt to showcase a different lens and hopes to share love. I pray, Father, for the hearts of everyone who heard the message that you just take hold and that you guide any frustrations or emotions or good feelings or Ill, Ill, Ill feelings in the right direction. I pray, Father, that you reveal in all of us anything that could be dangerous, any, any sin hidden in our heart, anything that separates us from you and your love, anything that stops good change that you would like to see in your kingdom, I pray, Father, that you just completely eradicate it. Father, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy, and I ask at this time for sincere forgiveness for myself, for the pastor, for this congregation, for the people of this country, for our leadership. On all fronts, Father, we are always in need of your grace, and we are always undeserving of your love, and yet you still provide. As we gather around the table, let our hearts be joyous that we can celebrate you and recognize you and remember you as brothers and sisters, regardless of the color of our skin. I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to receive the 
bread that represents the body of our Lord Jesus. Josh, it's my joy and privilege to share with you this bread. And as we partake of it, to invite all of us to receive the bread, acknowledging the death of the Lord Jesus for our sins. And before we receive the cup, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, in the 17th chapter of John, you prayed to your Father in heaven and specifically asked that we, the followers of the Lord Jesus, would become one, even as you and your Father are one. And we remind ourselves this morning that there's no need to pray for oneness unless we recognize that there is diversity. We come from different places with different experiences, different points of view, different passions and interests. But your desire, Lord Jesus, was that in you, all of those would be joined. Not that we would be changed necessarily in terms of those root issues that define who we are. Sometimes people say, I don't see color, but Lord, our God saw color. He created us, red, yellow, black, white. And all of us are precious in the Lord's sight. And we're precious because you redeemed us by the shedding of your blood. And as we receive this cup, Lord, may we be reminded that it is your blood that cleanses us of our sin, whether it's racism or any other sin. Your blood washes us and makes us clean and whole. And so, Lord, we ask that as we receive this cup, we would receive you, and our lives would be changed to give honor and glory to you. We pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you haven't opened your cup, you can do that. Let's share together in the cup of our Lord. I'm going to invite our team to come back, and we are going to close with a couple of songs. We've gone a bit long this morning, but this is a very important and difficult conversation to have. Obviously, we can't cover everything in one conversation. I hope that it's been beneficial to you who are here in the room and to those who are watching by live stream, and I hope that it is the start, at least, of other conversations. I would encourage all of us, when we talk about being proactive, that means finding relationship with others who are not like ourselves. Uh, in one of the conversations that I watched this week, a, a very good friend of mine, Ron Morrison, who pastors a church in the Cleveland area, made the comment that, and he was repeating what he had heard from another, that uh, change happens at the speed of relationship. That's a very good insight. Uh, if, if I don't know anybody who is different culturally and racially than me, I'm not giving much opportunity for change to happen in my own life or for change to happen in our culture. And so I would challenge each of us, find those opportunities to get to know others. It may be somebody in your workplace that you don't know that well. This is a, a very wonderful moment, actually, in our national history to go up to somebody that you don't know well and say, hey, I've been thinking of you. Can you tell me what you are experiencing in the midst of all this? You know, so many of our conversations are just, hi, how are you? Uh, but this is an opportunity to say, tell me what you're feeling. What has this meant to you? How are you dealing with this? And then listen. One of the things that we talked about in preparing for today is that every conversation involves speaking and listening. And very often in a conversation, we're so anxious to get our point of view out there that we, we, we want to make sure the other person hears us. I, I want you to understand me. I, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. But we're not listening to the other person very well. And we need to listen. And as we listen, we need to remind ourselves, I may think that I know, 
but I don't know. I may think that I understand, but I don't understand until I have listened. So stop the speech and open the ears and say, talk to me. What are you feeling? What do you need me to hear? And then watch what God will do in your heart as he begins to open you to that other person. You'll hear some things that you think, wow, I, I never looked at it that way. I never thought about that before. That's good. That's a step forward. So we have celebrated the Lord's death by receiving these elements. I want you to join us in singing. His name is blessed and he is holy and we're going to rejoice in that way as we conclude this worship and then we'll have a final closing prayer. Let's stand together. It is, it, it's blessed be the name. It's 221 in the hymnal. The words will be up on the screen, but if you don't know the song and you want to look at the music, it's in there. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme. Who gave his son for man to die, that he might then redeem? Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, you have devised salvation's plan, for you have died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be sharing with me this morning. This has been an important conversation. We've gone a little longer, but that's okay for certain topics. And we have been announcing to you that these services are being recorded and uploaded to YouTube as well as Facebook. 
uh, after the service is over. We've been telling people it's available by 11.30, but not when the pastor goes to 11.40. So uh, it will be up a little bit later, but uh, we're working toward getting to a point where we can simultaneously transmit with both YouTube and uh, Facebook, and so we're continuing to improve what we're doing. As you leave this morning, an offering plate is available. If you uh, have an offering to contribute for the work of the church, that will be out in the foyer. And I invite you to bow with me in prayer and ask that God will send us forth in the power of his Holy Spirit to do the work that he has assigned to each of us. Father, thank you for gathering us today. Thank you that there are more of us who are venturing out and we're able to be with one another in worship again. That's such a good feeling. Thank you as well, Lord, for the opportunity to reach many, many more by live stream. And we pray your blessing upon everyone in this audience, here or somewhere else. Lord, may you continue to do your work. And we do pray that your spirit would fill us. Lord, grant that we would have compassionate hearts, the hearts of Christ Jesus himself. And that we would desire to be your hands and feet and your voice in a lost world community. So that we can represent you well to others and help others draw nearer to you. So Lord, we commend ourselves to your care and pray that you would complete in us your perfect plan for each of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let's try to remember to keep the aisles open as we are making our way out.